I'll attempt to end this at 11.30, so you're not denied coffee. Our second session concerns adjusting to a new reality, the future of energy and the climate change agenda. As I was reading the conference papers uh, last week, my mind drifted back to 2007, uh, when we were all wondering uh, how high oil prices could go, and for producers, particularly in this region, there barely seemed to be a cloud on the horizon. There was no major rival producer waiting in the wings, or at least so it appeared. True, Russia had increased its output from approximately 6 million barrels a day at the end of the 90s to around 9 million, but the pace of growth was slowing. There was fast growth in Asia's developing markets, and those markets were largely unconfined in their energy usage by the Kyoto Protocol. Obviously, since then, um, the price has been on a roller coaster, uh, and the structure of the market has changed. U.S. shale has emerged, and it has changed the market, as Christoph Ruhl noted yesterday. Um, renewables has uh, taken uh, great strides forward, and some of the technology and the price of that technology uh, has fallen sharply. And we have the Paris Climate Agreement, and also, particularly in emerging Asia, uh, issues of air quality. It may be that if it's not greenhouse gases that prompt some change in Asia. It's air quality in the cities of India and China. Of course, there is considerable doubt um, about COP21. Um, John Knight referred to uh, President Trump's potential changes. The comment from him that I saw was that the US was still in the market, but only for the right deal. Um, uh, but the US, as always, is a land of considerable variety. There are governors, uh, there are mayors, there are corporations that have a different view to the president on those COP21 aspirations. So the uh, United States also, of course, is the land of Elon Musk. There is, in short, much for us to discuss here. And in a moment, I will hand over to our panel. It includes Simon Buckle of the OECD, Ken Kayani of the Institute uh, for Energy Economics in Japan, Neil Atkinson of the IAEA. But to start our discussion, I will ask in a moment His Excellency Mohammed bin Khalifa Al Khalifa, the oil minister of the Kingdom of Bahrain, to address this session. Uh, Alia has told you about the polling, so I don't need to do that. So I'm pleased and grateful um, that you have taken the time, sir, to join us for this session today. And then I invite you to share with us uh, your view on Bahrain's perspectives on market challenges and the approach that the Kingdom will take. Thank you, Nick. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking the IISS for organizing this fantastic forum, for the second time now in Bahrain. I'd like to also welcome uh, the distinguished panelists, who I'm sure will, will have a very interesting discussion for you on this second session of the day. Let me try and begin by setting the scene on what the major issues are. I think we primarily the talk is about the hydrocarbon industry and hydrocarbon. The most important thing in it is the oil and the oil price. So what has happened as of late? Um, well, uh, 2015 saw the decline, the very sharp decline of the oil price. That created uh, an unexpected challenge for oil producers, for the oil markets, and put a lot of un unexpected volatility into the future. So. Forecasting the future is a bit challenging. What caused that? If we go back to the financial crisis, there was a lot of quantitative easing uh, by the U.S. monetary policy. A lot of dollars were injected into the U.S. and the global economy. A big part of that cash went into fueling what became the shale revolution. So it was cheap credit and technology that was designed to be an inflationary stimulus created an unexpected oversupply in the most important commodity in the world. So that gave you a deflationary uh, unexpected stimulus in the world economy. Four million barrels came out unexpectedly from nowhere. And this is why we had an oversupply of crude. The inventories uh, were increased to unprecedented, unprecedented levels, and the oil price crashed. What happens when that uh, effect takes place, investment stops. And one of the problems with uh, the hydrocarbon industry is the effects of investment and lack of investment take a cycle, a number of years. So what we've created 
was more than a trillion do dollars of investments taken out of the system, which will have a negative impact. Why would they have an a negative impact? Oil, unlike other commodities, has a natural effect called the decline rate. Every oil well in the world will naturally decline by an average of 5%. Just to give you the numbers, so if we make it simple, the global oil supply demand say, is 100 million. It's a bit less than that, but make the numbers simple. 100 million barrels a day is what the world produces and consumes. At the end of each year, you will lose 5% of that. 5% of 100 million is 5 million barrels. So you will lose 5 million barrels a day from the existing oil pool. Now, demand is not decreasing. It slowed down, but it's still increasing by at least 1%. 1% 1 of 100 million is another million barrels. So we need 6 million barrels of new oil per day every year just to maintain the current status quo. Now, because of the lack of investment, that is going to be challenged. And what we're beginning to see, we heard that in yesterday's speech, and this is the most important ratio that I will tell you about today if you want to know the oil price. It's called the contingent inventory. That sets the oil price. It is inversely correlated, and basically it's today's inventory levels versus the five-year average. That, if you wanted to know the oil price, is the best tool to figuring it out. So consider yourselves well-versed in the arts of the oil price, if you know that. Since the beginning of the year, that number has dropped. It used to be 200 million barrels uh, of inventory higher than the five-year average. It's now 100 million. What happened to the oil price? We moved from the 40s into the 50s. Better levels, but still not spurring investment. So experts will tell you, and I think we'll hear the, hear the facts from OECD and the EIA, that there's a supply challenge coming up because of the short-term nature of the markets. Uh, they're saying by as much as 5 million barrels by 2021. I mean, that's a big problem. There is a sentiment that peak oil demand is a reality, and we haven't yet established that as fact. Are renewables going to take over? Are electric vehicles really going to replace gasoline cars, diesel trucks, etc.? Or is it still wishful thinking? I mean, we need facts. And then ultimately, you know, the climate change agenda, what do we do with trying to get cleaner energy? We in the hydrocarbon business try to promote the concept of clean energy as opposed to green, because green is sometimes thought of anti-hydrocarbon. We believe that hydrocarbon will, is, and will always be an important part of the energy mix. And unfortunately, there is no real replacement for it. And we think that the facts actually support that. Uh, plus, you know, the, the political developments of late with the U.S. policy, is it really shifting away from the Paris Accord, the COP21, what does that mean, etc. And some of the policy uh, statements we're hearing about, you know, banning the combustion engine by 2040 in Europe. Uh, and these are interesting times to really figure out in which direction we're heading. So let's go back to this notion of peak demand. People really believe that the electric car is going to replace gasoline cars in the not-so-distant future. If you look at the Tesla today, each Tesla would consume 60 kilograms of lithium. Lithium's production in the world is around 3,500 tons. If you would use all the lithium produced today, the maximum you can produce are half a million electric vehicles. The world consumes more than 200 million. If the scale isn't there, unfortunately, it would be nice to actually move in that direction. But the facts don't support it. I mean, there's a huge global economy that needs to be fueled out there. And there is no alternative that has a scalability of hydrocarbons. But we have to be careful not to create a supply problem too quickly. I mean, nobody wants a sharp jump in the oil price in the future. It's too disruptive to the global economy. But I think the facts that are becoming more obvious today is that we are going to face a supply problem if we're not too careful. 
And unfortunately for the oil business, these sharp cycles really affect the level of investments, uh, the workforce. All of a sudden, people don't graduate in the necessary degrees. Uh, young graduates avoid the oil industry for a while. We've seen that happen in the 90s. We lost a huge generation. There's a generational gap in the oil industry today. We're creating that in today's environment, and that's going to be problems for the future. I think you know, the irrationality of markets sometimes have a long-term negative effect. There was a study recently, going back to the environmental issue, of the uh, Swedish Environmental Institute, that the production cycle of a lithium battery for a Tesla car or any other electric vehicle uh, emits more carbon than eight years of a gasoline engine's emissions. So we also need to look at the alternative. Is an electric vehicle free of carbon emissions? And the facts are showing up that, no, actually, you're replacing one kind of pollution by another. So the culprit we see is emission and not hydrocarbons themselves. Hydrocarbons have been the most efficient carrier of energy the world has ever found, and oil in particular. It is more a transportation fuel. An energy fuel, gas, is probably the, the dominant uh, fuel for the future. And the U.S. has done the most coincidentally, and not by design, by shifting from coal-fired into gas simply because of technology producing shale gas. The net effect of that reduction in carbon has been the highest by coincidence and by effects of the market and without induced policy of climate change. The world has always worked best by allowing the markets to decide what's best for the future generations. Whenever policy comes in too quickly, the effects generally are negative. Europe started with renew renewables a bit too early. It was too expensive for Europe. And one of the challenges for the future is we need to be careful not to decide too quickly in policies and allow the markets and technology to do what they usually do. The horse and carriage industry did not disappear because somebody decided to ban it in the past. It disappeared because the technology was ripe enough and the car came in and took over. But we have to allow technology and the markets to decide what the future should hold for us and that's what oil companies would ultimately promote. If you look at the current focus, it's on emissions. We're looking at reducing CO2 emissions, carbon sequestration, and CO2 is actually a very important commodity in the future of petrochemicals. You can make various high-value-add products. You can make urea for fertilizer. So if there was a way of capturing CO2, uh, it can actually add more value. And th this is one of the things that a lot of research from oil companies, companies like Aramco in this region, and the Adnox, and even us uh, in Bahrain, we're looking at it. And ultimately, we believe that hydrocarbons will continue being the dominant fuel, especially for transport. And we don't think that there is a, a true replacement. And the world, I think, needs the growth, the energy, the transport. Uh, the demand is still healthy. Um, that, in a nutshell, is what some of my views are and what the touching points would be. And I, I thank you very much for your kind attention, and uh, thank you very much, Nick. And we'll be looking forward to the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I think you communicated your points very clearly. Uh, Clear, uh, clean, not green energy, and a call for more, uh, less volatility in the market to, to smooth the path for future investment. I turn now to our, our second speaker. Um, Neil Atkinson is the head of the oil, in, oil Industry and Markets Division of the IAEA and the editor of a publication I suspect many of you read uh, with great, uh, great diligence, the Oil Market Report. Neil, please. got here. Aha. No surprises. What I'm going to try and do in the next few minutes is uh, discuss 
or give you the main key points from the IEA's five-year oil market outlook, which we published in March of this year. Uh, and I'm going to try and do this in about six slides, although, of course, it's a massively complicated and, uh, and uh, difficult subject to, to convey uh, succinctly. Uh, and while I'm going along, I'll sort of self-correct part of the forecast, because six months is a very, very long time in oil markets, and uh, even for a five-year outlook. And uh, I'll try to give a, a sort of rolling update. Uh, but the essential parts of the message remain uh, much the same. Uh, and I may even fall into the temptation as we're going along and discussing the five-year outlook of, uh, of making a few comments about the very short-term oil market uh, because each month uh, one of my roles at the IEA is to be editor of the oil market report and uh, we published the September edition of the oil market report just last Wednesday and we have some quite interesting things to say. But I'll try and restrain myself from interjecting too much into the very short term and give you the key points for the the next five years. And we'll kick off with global oil demand. And here's, uh, I'll, to save time, I'll go and save some of all the animations. What we say at the top here, oil demand is continuing to grow, but at a slower pace. Now, there's no doubt that, uh, uh, as you can see on the, uh, on the graph on the left-hand side, we had very high rates of growth in 2015, 2016, partly in reaction or largely in reaction to the fact that crude oil prices and oil prices generally fell significantly from the uh, middle of 2014 or so onwards and then more rapidly through 2015 reflecting the change in OPEC policy. Uh, but in fact one of the first corrections that I should make live as we go along to this forecast is that uh, for 2016 and indeed 2017 where we are now we are already seeing signs that oil demand growth may be more resilient than we even felt back in March when we published this forecast. In 2017, we said the other day that global oil demand is likely to grow by 1.6 million barrels a day this year. At the start of this year, we thought the growth rate would be about 1.2 million barrels a day. Uh, various factors behind the increase in that uh, growth forecast, and we might come to that during Q&A. But uh, the main message it remains intact that oil demand is continuing to grow. The pace of growth will be slowing over the next five years or so, but it could well be that it's going to slow from a perhaps slightly higher base in 2017 than we thought just a few, uh, few months ago. And I should say, uh, as we, uh, I should have said at the very beginning, that the five-year outlook that we published was based on the uh, fu uh, oil future price curve which existed at that time, which was used as a modeling, uh, a modeling assumption. And the future curve back in the very end of 2016, very early part of 2017 when we were putting our work together, showed oil prices essentially flat for the next five years. And it was against that background that we made the forecast. So demand continuing to grow, but at a slower pace. Now, let's go on to supply, and we'll deal with some of these fancy uh, animations. They're so fancy that I uh, can't always cope with them. Here we go. Global oil supply rebounds, then slows markedly, is the title of this, um, of this slide. And what we have seen in 2015 and 2016 is a very, very large fall, a record slide, in fact, in global upstream spending in those two years. And so far, we've seen very little sign of significant recovery, although there are one or two announcements made here and there, and we've heard one or two of them referred to so far in this conference. But what we saw in 20. Uh, 16 was as a reaction to lower oil prices, oil production in the United States, which had risen very strongly in the previous few years, as we all know, that went in the reverse, and oil production in the United States actually fell, and production uh, growth slowed in one or two other places. But as we uh, move through 2017, and spectacularly in 2018, we're seeing a big rebound in global oil supply. United States shale production is on the upward uh, march again. We're seeing uh, growth in countries such as Brazil. We're seeing growth in Canada, Kazakhstan, and one or two other places around uh, the globe. So as the graph shows, there's a big <coughs> rebound in global oil supply in 2018. But then, as we move through the next few years, getting towards 2022, we see 
based on what we currently know about the investment plans uh, of uh, international companies, independent companies, national companies around the globe, we see growth in production capacity slowing considerably over the next five years based on what we currently know about their investment plans. So that has a, any possibly important consequences for the future, bearing in mind, as I said, that demand is still continuing to grow over the five-year period. Now, the United States has been, already, uh, has been mentioned already at this conference on many occasions, and uh, uh, Christoph uh, Ruhl said last night that if uh, economists have, uh, you know, 10 economists have 20 different opinions about subjects, well, if you ask uh, oil analysts, you'll get probably as many different opinions about the likely pace of growth or the, uh, the production profile in U.S. shale. But the U.S. is the leader in the global production growth that we're expecting over the next five years or so. And already we are perhaps here in the, in the situation where the second correction to the forecast as we go along might well be made. But based on our forecast earlier this year, we saw the U.S. leading the way over the next five years uh, with Canada, uh, and Brazil uh, within the leading non-OPEC countries, and then increases in production capacity, perhaps we're talking rather more hopefully here, but in countries such as uh, Iraq and Iran, uh, the UAE, Libya, which of course is an enormous judgment call as to what may happen there uh, politically. Further over on the right-hand side of the chart, you see the countries where we think that production capacity may actually shrink. And that includes uh, some of the OPEC countries, such as Venezuela, uh, Nigeria, Algeria. And then outside the uh, ranks of OPEC, you have uh, countries such as China. But the United States is going to be a leader. And within the, uh, 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 within the story of the United States itself, of course, US production is rebounding. But it's very, very price sensitive. And as a base case, uh, what we currently uh, are expecting is that U.S. light uh, tight oil will expand by about one and a half million barrels a day. It could now actually be slightly higher than that by 2022. But at higher prices, uh, the output could expand by considerably more. But we'll have to wait and see if high prices do come along. Uh, the main important point we need to make here, and this is perhaps a confession on behalf of the oil analyst community, is that we have had great difficulty understanding the United States shale industry. And what I mean by that is that first, 10 years ago, perhaps slightly more than 10 years or so ago, very, very, in fact, His Excellency, I think, referred to this in his remarks, very, very few people saw the rapid growth in production that we have seen, uh, foresaw the rapid growth in production that we have seen in the United States. Crude production in the US in 2007 or 8, I think it was, was 5 million barrels a day. It's now getting close to 10 million barrels a day, having gone up to 9.5, taken a dive down in the low oil price region, uh, low oil price environment. Now it's coming back up again. Uh, we had difficulty foreseeing that. The second difficulty we had was understanding the resilience of the United States shale oil producers when oil prices fell very dramatically. As we went from $100 a barrel all the way down to $30 a barrel at the beginning of 2016, at each uh, pricing point on the way down, ah, this is the end for U.S. shale, it's going to dry up, this is, uh, this is uh, just what the OPEC countries need to uh, call a halt to this, uh, to this uh, pesky competitor. Well, we fail to understand the resilience. We fail to appreciate the technical ingenuity. We fail to appreciate the ability to, uh, to improve operational efficiencies, the uh, inability to forecast, uh, as I said, their technical ingenuity, their ability to refinance, and their ability to keep going. We fail to accurately understand that. And now we're in the third phase, if you like, where with prices having apparently bottomed out and the uh, fall in the United States uh, shale oil production having begun to reverse and reverse quite strongly, again, how rapidly is it going to rebound? And there have been doubts expressed already at this conference about the, uh, about the resilience of the, uh, the business model in the U.S. shale sector, and those, uh, and those uh, doubts are held by many people around the industry. Uh, but a chart that we, uh, we keep internally at the IEA, and we, we do publish it from time to time, 
reflects the fact there are very wide divergences of views. And uh, if you take the views of various investment banks, oil consultants, and other people with views on this sector, and you uh, look at the, a chart which uh, ranks their expectations for U.S. shale growth over the next few years, you see a very, very wide range, a very, very wide range of views from a very wide range of very uh, well-informed and uh, intelligent people. So this third phase of the U.S. shale phenomenon is something that we are all grappling to understand. Now, as we uh, move on through the outlook, one of the key points that we uh, like to uh, emphasize is that the requirements of the uh, Asian uh, economies, where oil demand is, it will continue to grow strongly over the next five years, their import requirements are growing uh, to grow. And uh, Asian countries uh, are continuing, continuing to ramp up their refining capacity to meet this growing demand. But at the same time, oil production in the Asian region uh, is declining. China is one of the uh, leading uh, countries within this category. And of course, this is driving up the net crude oil import requirement into the Asian market. And China is already the biggest uh, net importer of crude, uh, crude oil. It's overtaken the, the United States. And uh, essentially, by 2022, the end of our five-year outlook, there is going to be no net crude oil uh, exporting country in Asia. Uh, Indonesia's role, which uh, uh, or Indonesia had that role uh, until a few years ago, but that's no longer the case. And indeed, Indonesia will be an Im a net importer by about, uh, to the tune of about half a million barrels a day. But right now, even if uh, the Middle East sends all of its crude uh, to Asia, the Asian region is still going to be about a, a million barrels a day in deficit. And this is a very, very big change from a few years ago. And over the next few years, this deficit grows to about 4 million barrels a day, based on our current expectations of Asian demand growth. And this means that even if uh, middle, the Middle East sends all of its available exports to Asia, the region, Asia, will still need to import about 4 million barrels a day from someplace else, the Americas, the United States, which, of course, is going to grow as, a, as an important player uh, in, in international oil trade elsewhere in Latin America from countries such as uh, uh, Brazil, which is seeing its production grow over the next five years, from African producers, Russia, and, of course, in Central Asia. So there is going to be an increasing uh, pull from Asia for crude oil into that region. And that is a huge issue because, as we were saying earlier on, investment in the upstream sector in 2015, 2016 has been fairly low. Within the Middle Eastern region, of course, their own markets are growing. They're consuming more oil uh, domestically, despite the efforts that are being made over, year, over the next few years to try to, uh, to, try, to try to change the structure of the domestic energy markets within the Middle East. But the Asian economies are going to be pulling more crude, and that crude will have to come from somewhere. Uh, the final substantive slide uh, that we have is, and I think we've got all the, yes, we have all the little uh, animations on here. And this summarizes the view that we have, which is slightly changed uh, since March, but in essence it remains essentially in place. Over the next few years, because of the uh, continuing growth in oil demand, uh, set against the backdrop of lower investment in the last two or three years, the call on production from the OPEC countries is expected, is expected to rise. And by the end of the forecast period, the right-hand uh, end of the, of the slide that's up on the screen now, we are seeing that based on today's snapshot, the current spare capacity cushion which is available in the world, which is held exclusively within the OPEC countries and one or two non-OPEC countries that are supporting uh, OPEC in its output cuts, that capacity is going to shrink without further upstream investment. So there is a risk, and it's a risk, this is not, a, uh, of course, a certainty, that by the end of the five-year period, the spare capacity cushion could have shrunk to such a level that the, and uh, during which time oil stocks will have drawn down from the very high levels they currently are, 
that the world is in the, uh, the po no, there is at least the possibility of going back to the situation we had 10 years ago, which His Excellency also referred to when oil prices were very, very high at a time when demand was growing and there was very, spare, very little spare production capacity available in the world. And relatively minor geopolitical events or the threat of geopolitical disruption was enough to, co to continue to spur oil prices upwards. Now, we're not saying that that is what will happen. This is a scenario. It's based on our current expectations of demand growth, our current feeling that at the moment, even though prices are lower and costs are lower, there is still not enough signs of investment beginning to return. And that raises the risk of, of tightening of the market in, uh, uh, in, the, in the next five years and a risk to uh, the stability of uh, oil prices uh, so I'll end at that point. I do have uh, a lot of other slides, but I'm not going to uh, go through those. And perhaps during the Q&A, we can uh, uh, perhaps raise one or two points about the very short-term oil market, for, on which, of course, I have uh, <coughs> views as well. So thank you very much for now. Uh, Neil, thank you. Um, I turn now to uh, Ken Koyama, who's Chief Economist and Managing Director of the Institute please, for energy uh, economics in Japan. Uh, he's an advisor to the Japanese government on matters of energy security. Thank you, Nick, for your kind introduction. Uh, your Excellency and distinguished uh, participant, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank WIWS for inviting me for this uh, very important forum uh, as a speaker, and uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, this morning, I'm very happy to share my views on the uh, future of world energy, uh, particularly with a special focus given to Asia and the Middle East from the viewpoint of uh, mutual dependence. And my previous uh, speaker, Nick, made a wonderful presentation on the short and medium term oil market. I also try to provide some views from different angles. Uh, in the long run, my point here is very simple, uh, that now the gravity center of the global energy market is clearly shifting to Asia, in particular emerging Asia. Uh, so you can see that the other emerging area like uh, Africa, Middle East, uh, Latin America will see a substantial increase in energy demand growth up to 2040, but it is China, followed by India, and now ASEAN, these three Asian emerging economy is expected to account for more than 60% of global incremental energy demand up to 2040. And this is based on our institute uh, reference case scenario. So clearly what's going to happen here in Asia, China, India, ASEAN, will shape global energy landscape from the viewpoint of energy demand, economic growth, technology, as the minister pointed out, and other policy development will affect the trajectory of demand growth in the world, but in Asia as well. And as for the long-term energy oil supply demand balance for oil in Asia, it is clearly indicated here that we in Asia is going to be more and more import dependent for oil supply. This is very contrary to the situation in the United States where the, the country is heading for energy independence. And while European nations, that overall energy demand is expected to stagnate. So in our reference scenario, that Asia will become about 85 oil import dependence in the year 2040. So our question being asked in Asia is where that additional oil will, should come from. Clearly, as Neil pointed out, we will need more oil from Western Hemisphere, United States, Canada, Brazil, but I think that the majority part of the demand, uh, incremental major part, is from this region. Or in other words, the Middle East continues to be a very important supplier, oil supplier to Asia. Of course, we need to uh, we people in, need, uh, in Asia need to promote a diversification policy, not only for energy source diversification, but also oil import source diversification. But the fact remains that Middle East continues to be a very important supplier to Asia. 
But on the other side of the picture is Middle East need, need Asia as a very important outlet for short term, medium term, and probably for long term, the oil revenue or LNG or natural gas revenue to these, uh, the country in this region is critically important. Of course, that economic diversification policy is very, very important, need to play, but in the, particularly in the medium term, how to secure that the energy revenue is very, very important topic, uh, in a sense, a top priority for this region. And as you can see, not only for the case for oil, which I came up later, that LNG is also very important uh, energy commodity export from this region to, the middle, uh, to Asia. Currently, almost 40% of LNG supply is from Middle East, Qatar, UAE, and uh, uh, Oman. So I think that the LNG question is also very important for this region as well as to Asia. But this, from the point of uh, Asian perspective, uh, sorry, this is a very busy chart, but uh, simple, try to illustrate from Asian point of view that the Middle East continue to be very complicated situation in terms of the geopolitics or uh, country stability or country relationship in this region. And on top of that, as we discussed in the first session, what going to happen about the uh, U.S. policy towards the Middle East may further complicate the situation or the stability of this region. So people in Asia, China, and India, and ASEAN, and traditionally in Japan, continue to think about the energy security question with regard to the stability on the Middle East. So it is a very important question that people, energy policy planner in Asia, is continue to asking uh, ask. Of course, everybody knows that the currently oil price is very low and also characterized by that oversupply, but at the same time, energy policy planner in Asia potentially think that the, what's the meaning of the geopolitical instability in this region for the purpose of energy stability in Asia. The next topic that I'd like to cover is gas or LNG. And gas is favored energy fuel, and as probably Many of you remember that the IEA invented a very nice concept of golden age of gas about five years ago, where gas play a very, very important role in the energy mix. And I have to say that now the United States is enjoying the golden age of gas, simply because that the share revolution makes gas very competitive. But what happened in Asia? What happened in Europe? Unfortunately, I would say that golden age of gas has not come in Asia and in Europe. Why? The reason is very simple. Gas is very advantageous in terms of, for example, environment, but gas need to compete with other fuel like coal, renewable, and nuclear power in Asia. So that's a very, very important issue that when we think about the future of natural gas. Of course, we expect natural gas demand in Asia in particular continue to grow. This chart on the left hand side is a uh, uh, demand growth mix in the world and yellow part uh, indicated, uh, is indicates that uh, LNG demand in Asia. As you can see that LNG demand in Asia continue to dominate in the global LNG market and I also agree with the IEA's view that uh, LNG is continue to become more and more important in terms of natural gas trade in the world. Currently, pipeline gas is a mainstream, but in the 2030, 2040, LNG continue to be a, will become a major, major part of the global gas business. So in this regard, Asia again is a very important source of the growth. But as you can see from the right-hand side picture, there is a structural change in LNG demand. That the red bar shows that the very traditional LNG demand country, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, where the demand is expected to almost flatten out. While yellow part, the emerging Asian LNG demand from China, from India, from ASEAN country, or other from South Asian country, increased substantially. What does that mean? 
I think that the market structure of LNG is rapidly changing. Particularly, the emerging market needs a more competitive and more flexible LNG supply. So I think that the sellers or producers of LNG in the world, and including those in this region, need to understand that the changing market structure. And also, as Neil pointed out in the uh, picture of oil market, this is an illustration of the LNG supply demand up to 2030. Put it very simply, currently that the global LNG market is characterized by oversupply because of the many, many big project was investment decision was made during the period of high oil price or high LNG price. So thanks to that, we are seeing that the big oversupply, probably up to around 2021, 20, 22, 22, 23, I don't know. But anyway, now market is characterized by oversupply. But again, that because of the lower price of gas and crude oil, many people find it very difficult to make the final investment decision. So beyond sometime in the 2020, we will see the pendulum of supply demand may swing back again. So that's what the Asian policy planner is uh, watching very carefully what's going to happen in the field of LNG. So my final point is under the current market circumstance, the buyers in Asia is need more flexible supply and competitive supply. So I do think that from the now on to the timing around the 2020, this is a very important timing and topic for both producers and uh, consumers of LNG for discussing and finding <coughs> out what is the best solution to realize the golden age of gas in Asia. I think this is a very important for Asia, but probably important for the supplier as well. My final word is summarized here, so I will not repeat, but I'd like to make a three very important points for my final remark. Firstly, Asia and the Middle East is going to be increasingly into interdependent situation. So what happened in Asia in terms of the economy, in terms of the technology, and in terms of the marketplace will affect the future of energy industry here in this region. And at the same time, in the long run, there is a lot of uncertainty over geopolitics, economy, and technology again, as the minister pointed out at, at the first remarks. So I think it is very important, while in the medium term, how to secure the energy revenue in this region is very important, but at the same time, economic diversification is also a very, very serious agenda. Thank you very much. Ken, thank you very much. Uh, our final speaker is Simon Buckle. If you have a look at the app, you'll see he's had an unusually varied career. He's a theoretical physicist who, uh, who now works uh, at the OECD as the head of climate, biodiversity, and water. Simon, please. Your Excellency, distinguished guests and pa panelists, and thank you to IIS for the introduction the invitation to come and talk to you today. I really welcome the chance to come and talk about climate change. I think uh, it's an issue that, that clearly um, is key for this region in terms of how the world responds and how the region responds. So what am I going to talk about? The climate challenge post the Paris Agreement. A recent IEA OECD collaboration which resulted in an OECD report and the parallel IEA IRENA report on the growth climate carbon challenge. And that was in the context of the G20 presidency. And then I'm going to come to some of the issues about pathways to low emissions futures. And it, it links a little bit to what Christoph was talking about last night in his keynote. So uh, hopefully I can make some connections to the broader economic agenda here too. The, the basic challenge or the basic question is what sort of world do we want? What sort of climate do we want? If we look at these charts from the IPCC fifth assessment report, we see projections for the surface temperature in a scenario where strong mitigation action is taken, emissions don't rise so high, 
mean temperatures maybe are restricted to something like 1.7 degrees average over the planet. And you see even there there's quite considerable warming at the high latitudes in particular and over the land. Conversely, if we have very much a business as usual approach, the IEA projected a very different world. And this is a, a very emissions intensive uh, future in which you see warming more of the order of four to five degrees centigrade by the end of, of the century and immense challenges as we see very, very large changes in temperature over the high latitudes, maybe getting into double figures around the Arctic and also major changes over continents. And of course, precipitation changes as well. The climate isn't just temperature, it's the whole system. And in the bottom panel, we see the precipitation corresponding to those two scenarios also. These are more uncertain than the temperature projections. It's very hard to predict the dynamics of the weather's response. But you can see that you get drying in the subtropics, um, intensification of precipitation in the, in the tropics and the high latitudes. And of course, a lot of the MENA region uh, could be subject to significant further drying, and you can see that from the, the brown shading, particularly on the um, bottom right chart. So we've got some basic choices to make, and the way that the Paris Agreement framed these was that the world committed to a well below two degree target, with efforts actually to go beyond that towards 1.5 degrees, to hold that temperature increase to 1.5 degrees, because of the risks that are seen for vulnerable economies, in particular for small island states, there was pressure to go below the two degrees, which had been hitherto the benchmark of international discussions. And, and to get to that, you've got to realize the scale, the enormity of that challenge, and perhaps the, the minister does, and that was behind some of his remarks earlier. This is really about 15 or 30 years, perhaps, of, of CO2 emissions at current levels. This is an immense transformation that the leaders have committed to, and yet their commitments in the nationally determined contributions that we heard about earlier are still inadequate to that task and lie somewhere in between those two extreme scenarios that I showed you earlier. To reach the sort of temperature goals that the Paris Agreement gives you, you need global greenhouse gas emissions to peak as soon as possible. Now, there's some possibly good news there. The IEA's recent emissions figures show actually energy emissions more or less plateauing, and that's for the last three years in a row. But in the long term, in the second half of the century, net emissions have to become zero, or more likely if we don't manage to make enough efforts early on, to actually go negative, and you see various schemes for drawing down CO2 actually from the atmosphere because you need negative emissions to maintain that temperature target. The CO2 stays in the atmosphere an awful long time. It's what we call a stock pollutant. It doesn't wash out of the air from month to month like aerosols do. And so you've got a finite budget. And the scale of what needs to be done in energy, transport, buildings, and so on, also depends heavily on what happens in the agriculture, forestry, land use sectors. And I'm not going to speak about that in all, uh, to, at a great length today, but what happens on deforestation, what happens in terms of agricultural developments, demand for food as economies grow richer and more populous, all these things will affect emissions there too. Coming to this report that uh, the German presidency asked both the IEA and the OECD to, to work on, and we ended up doing two different reports for the Energy Ministry and the Environment Ministry, which just shows that siloization still exists in the best governments in the world. But we, we, we did this report, Investing in Climate, Investing in Growth, and you can see there a picture of the OECD Secretary General, Angel Guria, handing that over and presenting that to the Chancellor. And yeah, the, the, highlight, the highlight from that is boosting economic growth does not mean locking the world into a high emissions future. And perhaps I can say a few words about what the OECD thinks in terms of the, the recipe for doing that. This is a picture of, of where the world, or rather the G20 actually, stands in terms of the CO2 intensity of energy on the y-axis vertically and the energy intensity of GDP on the x-axis. And you can see a huge spread, a huge diversity with the most um, 
coal intensive economies right at the top right, some of the energy inefficient economies towards the, the right, maybe a little bit lower down too, in some cases like Canada and Russia where the climate is, is very challenging. And then a range of countries who have higher efficiency, lower emissions. And France, for example, with its large nuclear program, appears to be very uh, advanced in terms of, of both efficiency and CO2 intensity of energy. And the direction of travel is down to the left. So if you look at the IEA's modeling for this um, well below two degrees scenario, they have little stage marks for 2010, 2030, 2040, 2050 that are shown by those lines in various shades of yellow and green. And so by 2050, you've got to be doing a heck of a lot in terms of decarbonization, not just in terms of the energy efficiency improvements, which, as we heard, have been pro progressing at about 2% a year and are broadly on track for what's needed. It's the CO2 intensity of the energy that's the, the challenge here. What our economics department did, and I, I'm from the environment directorate, not the economics department, but I'll tell you about what the work was that they did. They, they did some, some macro modeling of how you could combine quite stringent, ambitious mitigation action, taking results from the IEA's modeling in terms of, of the investments that would be needed, adding to that investment and structural reform to enhance competitiveness, innovation, productivity. And those are the first three columns in that chart showing the contributions to GDP in 2050, to the level of GDP, not to growth. And then an offsetting term reflecting perhaps higher carbon prices, energy prices, but also stranded assets from fossil investments that then don't recoup their investments. And the net effect is basically you can take strong climate action as long as you integrate it with these structural reform measures and pretty much you, you, you leave growth unaffected or maybe slightly higher. And that's not even counting the climate damages that you manage to avoid, which are the final column reflected there in the final column. So that's a really strong message. You can, you can have a high investment, high innovation, structural reform agenda with strong climate action, and actually the world can keep growing. Pretty good news. It's challenging, though, because, as I say, you need to have these pro-structural, pro-growth structural reforms. You need to have also core climate policies. That's carbon pricing, which is very weak in most parts of the world. In fact, the effective carbon rate uh, where it's highest is largely on transport fuels and demand for the service is quite inelastic, as uh, the minister um, pointed out. Demand actually there is very strong. And then there's also the issue of fossil fuel subsidies, of support for new technologies as well in there. And you also need this, this third, this orange bubble, well-aligned investment environment. So you need good competition policy, you need political stability, you need good governance. All these things that help people feel confident and able to invest either domestically or with foreign investment in, in the low emissions economy of the future. So those are the three key components, if you like. Looking now to MENA, it's a very diverse region, as you know better than I. And this is just a chart to illustrate that in terms of GDP absolute levels and GDP per capita on the x-axis. There's a huge issue in terms of, of fossil fuel revenues. The, the, the sheer scale of those in relation to the, the economies in the region is, is very large, particularly in, in the oil and gas producing countries, as you well know. Some of the, the smaller MENA countries obviously um, benefiting less from that. And the OECD average, of course, is tiny. That's the red line. Stranded assets, in, in a two degree, well below two degree scenario, if you take action more or less from 2020 or from now onwards, the stranded assets globally are about a trillion dollars, a bit less. Most of that would be in terms of, of say, coal plants, say about 300 million bid over, and then production <laughs> assets for oil and gas, 500 uh, billion. What happens, though, if you delay action and then try to scramble to achieve these mitigation targets, so you, you, you let things roll for another five or ten years, you actually get far greater stranded assets. The investments that have taken place in the meantime catch up with you, 
and uh, you either have locked in emissions and you miss your targets or you have to, to scrap the investments before they've made an economic return. Interestingly, China abandoned plans for 300 gigawatts of coal in 2016, and I think about a sixth of that were actually under, under construction. So they certainly are taking air pollution and climate seriously. I think the two go together. Clearly, heavy industry has a major challenge. How do you decarbonize steel, aluminium, uh, and cement production? We need innovation. We need uh, new, new approaches, new technologies. CCS is a technology that could be extremely useful, for example, in industry. We need to think about jobs and, and a just transition, risk of stranded communities. That, that's a me message, I think, that resonates here, where you have a very large um, dependence on the public sector for employment, a large young population coming through. And we need to maximize the, the co-benefits of climate action, pollution, health, and avoided damages, for example, things like water security. Just a quick chart there that I'll skip over very quickly without talking about it, but it's basically uh, the changes in air pollution, which um, occur from now to 2060 could double exposure and premature deaths even in the MENA region. Uh, I know a lot of that red shading there reflects um, mineral dust, but there's also a big component that comes from power generation. So it's not just the, the, the desert. Pointers to long-term pathways. We need to invest the, the considerable revenues for this future. So education, skills, jobs. We've heard about the digitalization agenda that's coming, the need for, for new industries in, in the region. They, the revenues are vulnerable to technological change. EVs may indeed be limited by lithium. There are other options, there are other models for uh, personal transport. So I think whatever you think about the future of, of EVs, uh, the challenges will keep coming. Whether it's new business models, um, smaller, smarter cities, whatever. We need coherent reforms to enhance the private sector, improve investment, and give, give a real boost to the SME sectors. And in terms of electricity, blessed with, with solar resource, you should be able to do away with the 30% of planned future investment in generation that is to do with oil and coal, basically. So there's a lot that can be done. And if, as I think is necessary, fossil fuels will be required for certain purposes going into the future, we've got to make sure that the emissions are captured or used. So CCX technologies or cap carbon capture and usage technologies are, are critically important. And I think uh, the region and universities in the region in particular with companies should be thinking around how to, to build these up to scale, how to demonstrate them and reduce the costs because they are pretty costly at the moment. But it seems to me that's, that's a key aspect of a political transition to a low emissions economy. And just in terms of political commitment, that's a family photo from the G20 summit this year um, with, with, with the other G20 leaders all saying that uh, Paris agreement is irreversible and uh, taking note of our, our report, which was, was a nice um, thing to happen. But this agenda is here to stay. Whether, whether countries actually make the very stringent targets that have set in the Paris Agreement, who knows? But every marginal reduction in risk we can get um, is valuable. And the technologies are coming down in price to allow us to make the first and easy steps in the energy and electricity systems. There are some more challenging problems ahead, but we have the, the ability to overcome those too, I think. So thank you very much. Uh, Simon, thank you. Um, without further ado, I'd like to move on to questions. Now it's your turn. Um, if you're at the back, could you please make sure that you raise your hand high, because uh, the lighting is stronger here than it is down there. I can ask you please to start with your um, affiliation and, and name before you, you put your question. I'll try and gather questions in, in clumps. The first person to raise their hand is uh, here, please. Yes. Yeah. 
thank you, Chair. Uh, and just first of all, thank you to the panelists for their very inf informative talks. Um, I think it's definitely time to meet the global energy challenge, where more energy will be needed, uh, but with less emissions. Um, and I think there's a number of tools and drivers, uh, which we already spoke about in the talks, including international agree agreements, uh, particularly the Paris Agreement, uh, our vulnerability as, a, as Bahrain, as a small island state, on the impacts of climate change, uh, and current domestic renewable energy and ener energy efficiency targets, and the very serious air quality concerns that we have. And I think um, there are a few misconceptions for the oil and gas industry where they are classified as the biggest culprit. Um, and I think, I think Simon Buckle uh, spoke briefly on agriculture and deforestation. And so I think those, uh, those topics are not necessarily spoken about and they're not um, given the amount of weight because they do affect climate change in a very uh, serious way. Um, and I know in, in terms of OPEC and oil and gas, at least in the climate change uh, community, um, they're very active in the Paris Agreement and they believe in energy efficiency um, as a way to solve the problem. And I think also, since we have a speak from Japan, Japan is one of the uh, main prime examples of how energy efficiency um, can help solve a, a, a kind of a state's uh, kind of progress in terms of the energy matrix. Um, and also, just to mention, um, in terms of the oil and gas sector, um, we also have a lot of different kind of details within the Paris Agreement to, to, that considers the oil and gas sector. Um, and I just think we're moving very quickly. Um, where, I mean, for example, today in Bahrain, there's two other events on energy and environment. Um, one is the Solar Technology Expo, the other is Sustainable Cities. But I think we do need to take heed when it comes to policy making and even the language. Um, that we use, which can sometimes be misleading. So my question is, um, with all things considered, uh, Trump, China, uh, industry models, uh, how much has and how will the Paris Agreement affect the strategic direct direction of the oil community? And how fast will they react? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Gentlemen, about fourth row. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, the energy industry. Uh, I know that uh, the energy industry is very dynamic. There are uh, rise in the number of producing uh, liquefied natural gas uh, in uh, Africa countries, also Asia Pacific region. Uh, but after Qatar uh, declared in the uh, previous months that will uh, increase its production by one third, uh, how it will uh, shape the energy industry in the next years? Uh, and how it will impact the uh, other producing uh, country, uh, countries, especially uh, Australia, it's, um, as it has uh, aspiration to uh, increase its uh, market share uh, in the next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, you're holding your hand very high. <laughs> I was trying. <laughs> My name is Phil Dufty. I'm from the Emirates Diplomatic Academy. Um, and I was very interested in the presentations and very interested particularly in the analysis of the of Asian oil uh, requirements. I have sort of two two part question. One is for Dr. Atkinson, which is um, what I was struck by as I'm a not I'm not a doctor. Ah, I must Mr. deny that immediately. I'm the only person here that isn't, uh, I think, but uh, I can't. No. I will ask you nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> um, I was struck as a layman by the forecasts of oil production in Asia and how they remain uh, relatively low uh, going uh, long into the future. And I wondered to what extent there's a possibility of a shock in supply uh, in, of, of oil from uh, Asia, um, uh, particularly taking into account your comments about uh, forecasts of oil shale um, uh, 10 years ago in the US. Um, and the second question about Asian oil requirements is uh, for Dr. Koyama, um, I was struck by your slide uh, on all the troubles in the Middle East um, and thinking about how that looks from uh, capitals in Asia um, and just wondering to what extent uh, is that factored into uh, future planning of sourcing of oil imports in Asian capitals um, and to what extent do they have a choice about where those uh, future imports, that where the growth in future imports will, will come from. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady at the back, please. Thank you. Yes, please. 
Hi, my name is Leon Kim. I work for Global Green Growth Institute. My, my question is about how oil producing and hydrocarbon driven economies like Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi, UAE uh, can reconcile its need uh, for, to invest and expand the conventional, you know, the oil producing capacity with its desire to diversify its economy into uh, a more uh, resilient, uh, greener, cleaner uh, economic system. So the, for the latter part, the Saudi, Saudi Qatar, UAE, Bahrain, uh, put out their ambitious visions, Vision 2030, and the, in their uh, programs um, to diversify economies, uh, the very aggressive uh, introduction of clean energy, including solar, and also some part, uh, these uh, enhanced oil recovery from CCS, clean, uh, cl cleaner way of producing uh, conventional oil and gas resources, and also developing the more val higher value added uh, sectors in uh, oil value chain, petrochemicals, refineries, and so on and so All these you know, the desires and ambitions together, while there is clear need to uh, further expand its conventional uh, capacity to produce uh, the fossil fuel, how the, how do the, this oil economy can reconcile this short-term needs and also long-term vision? Thank, Thank you, you. Much. Um, I'll just take one more question and then perhaps we'll come back for a second round. And the person who caught my eye was you, sir, in red striped tie, please. Uh, thank you, Tarek Sadek, uh, Esquire United Nation. Uh, I just want to ask to what extent the carbon uh, capturing utilization and storage can be used as a potential mitigation measure in our region in the Middle East based on the experiments uh, already in the Gulf countries and are technologies uh, available for uh, and localized for these uh, measure in the region? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I, know, uh, I particularly appreciate it. You, you were very short with it. Uh, I'd like to come back to our panel now. I think within those five questions, there's uh, something for everybody. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed, would you like to go first, please? It's a bit challenging to remember all these uh, questions, but I can start with uh, Noor Al Amr. She's one of the young leaders here in Bahrain that's uh, focused on the environment. Uh, she's done a lot of good work for us in uh, negotiations with the Paris Agreement. Uh, we're doing uh, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of initiatives towards achieving some of those uh, set goals in, in the oil industry. Of course, CCS is uh, an area we're looking at. Uh, Bahrain is looking at uh, making use of funds available from the uh, Green Climate Fund, which we've uh, asked to have regional uh, presence here in Bahrain for. Uh, we're working with the Electricity and Water Authority, as you know, to introduce solar. We're looking at pilot projects to install solar panels on, uh, uh, on residential houses. Uh, you know, the prices have come down significantly. Now they're actually well below uh, uh, the full cost of power generation from hydrocarbons. A few years ago, uh, it had to be subsidized. Today, I think we, uh, we heard yesterday that uh, Abu Dhabi uh, managed to get uh, solar power at below three cents a kilowatt hour. I mean, that's extremely cheap. Uh, if that can be achieved, then what we're trying to look at is relieving uh, the, uh, the subsidized electricity tariff for households, which is the reason we have one of the highest consumption patterns, by introducing solar. So rather than just suddenly increase the electricity tariffs, see if we can use solar panels on houses. And now with these smart meters, what happens is you have net metering. So all power generated reverses your uh, meter at the, at the home. So you, our calculations show, show around 30% reduction per household. Uh, and many other projects, you know, we have uh, intensive investments in upgrading the refinery. So you're uh, replacing old units that are less efficient and uh, getting rid of their uh, emissions, which, uh, which have been uh, decades old. Uh, we're upgrading the quality of the uh, supply of gasoline here. 
uh, even looking at things like the, the lubric lubricants for, for cars, moving it into what's called uh, grade three, those also have a positive environmental impact. And together with the environmental agency, of course, measuring the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and making sure that the targets are effectively met. Uh, so we take all of these things seriously and many initiatives are there. Uh, if you want to remind me of the other questions, uh, or maybe I can stop here. I think, I think that's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Neil, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief because this is an enormous range of issues <laughs> raised by some extremely uh, detailed questions. Uh, my perspective is, is short and medium term oil market outlook. However, of course, uh, my colleagues at the IA are looking beyond that, as indeed uh, we in our work as well. Uh, re reconciling the short term needs and the, the here and now situation uh, of the oil industry with the requirement for the oil industry to play its part in the transition over the next 40 years or so, go to, uh, next 40 years or so to a low carbon world is not, I think, uh, perhaps as, as difficult as it's uh, as it painted out, because it's going to be a long-term transition. Whatever uh, the urgency may be for adaptation to uh, uh, to a low-carbon world, well, however urgent it may be in terms of what we're seeing in rising temperatures now, the reality is, whether it be by, uh, because of politics, whether it be because of technology, the reality is that that transition is going to take place over quite a long period of time, although the estimates of how long that is going to take are, of course, coming down because barely a week goes by without uh, hearing from the auto sector, for example, announcements by car makers that, electric, uh, uh, that fleets of electric vehicles will be launched onto the market in the next few years, governments making announcements that uh, the internal combustion uh, model will end in 2030, 2040, take your pick, whichever country it is. So there's an awful lot going on up there, but as far as oil demand is concerned, in the next, in the next uh, 20 years or so, yes, oil is going to lose its share in, in power generation, it's going to lose its share in buildings, it'll lose its share in passenger cars, and that's going to be hugely important. But oil is going to grow, continue to grow in some sectors, inevitably, and that includes in the maritime sector, freight uh, movement in the aviation market, which is uh, often under, uh, uh, rather overlooked in terms of a sector where oil demand will grow considerably due to enormous demand. And last but not least, it's also going to grow in petrochemicals. So there is still, in this medium and indeed longish term to 2040, an important place for the oil industry, while the oil industry has to be aware that as time goes by, it will need to adapt to a new world. And those companies will do so. They're, they're transforming themselves more from traditional oil and gas companies into energy companies. They're making investments in the different forms of energy. And within the uh, ranks of the major companies, you have an enormous number of highly qualified, highly educated, and not all old, old men either, by the way, uh, people who are capable of aiding the transformation the industry makes from the, from the traditional model we have today to the new cleaner future. So I'm optimistic that that change will happen, uh, but I'm also, I think, realistic in that the world that we live in today with politics and with, uh, with the speed of technological development that is actually available, that it is going to take some time and there is still an important role for the oil industry to play. I think I'll end at that point because I think all of us could keep going for a very long time. Ken, please. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to take uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, Qatar LNG and the other is uh, oil policy in Asia. Uh, the first one that uh, I, I myself was uh, very much impressed by the uh, announcement made by Qatar to lift the moratorium or to develop the North Field, which is the largest gas field in the world. And uh, it's the uh, first time for the last 20, uh, 12 years. And uh, given that uh, Qatar LNG project potentially is the uh, world most competitive in terms of the LNG project in the world. I think that this is a very, very significant uh, decision made by the government of Qatar. And also, we, I noted that the timing is very, very critical. Uh, if the expected schedule is going to be realized in a very smooth manner, uh, that Qatar LNG project 
he coming on stream sometime around 2022 or 2023, which I explained that the, the timing of the market balance in LNG may change. So in that respect, the addition of Qatar LNG supply to the global LNG market is a very, very significant from the stability of the global LNG market. But of course, because of the very strong price competitiveness, other, I would say, higher cost LNG projects like those in, I, I would say, East Africa or Canada or whatever country will face a very serious challenge from very strong Qatar introduction. But as, as again, it is very important development in my view. But after that, we, people in Asia also noted that about the GCC tension issues and other issues. So we are watching very carefully what's going to happen in the project. And the second question about oil policy, which is both very important, is of course, people in Asia, including Japan, China, Korea, every country is very keen the idea of import source diversification. We are depending on the Middle East supply. We try to find alternative supply from Africa, South America, or Russia, or whatever country where it is economically feasible. But oil supply security policy is not limited to the oil import diversification. Firstly, we need to reduce the oil demand or we diversify our own energy mix to increase the share of energy sources. And also, we need to uh, enhance the uh, contingent uh, uh, emergency preparedness policy. For example, to have a better preparedness for at the time of the oil supply interruption, uh, that uh, Japan and Korea is a member of IEA, but now that we noted that the China and the India and the other Asian country is actually doing or became very keen to uh, increase the oil stockpiling capability and to have a better preparedness by doing a lot of emergency study or emergency training uh, helped by IEA. So I think that uh, this is that oil import diversification is one important element, but I would <coughs> say that the other policy element is also very important to address the energy security challenges for the region. So I'd like to pick up on the point made by the lady from GGGI. And I think it's a really important question if you look at what's the, what's the pattern of the composition of investment in the short term and the long term if we're going to achieve multiple goals. It's not just climate, it's not just the economy, there's water, there's food, there's the whole agenda. And, and these problems have become much more interconnected as the world has become much more interconnected, as our uh, commerce becomes transnational and so on. So we know there's a, a generational transition, it's going to be taking place over decades, but there's also going to be some surprises within that and some things can happen quicker than others. And the extent to which the governments take a role in actually driving some of those technological changes is important. And I think the Chinese government in terms of, of, of the solar production and the German government in terms of um, producing, if you like, a demand for the, the PV technology made a radical change in that whole market. So that happened over 10 years, 15 years or so. There are things here that, that are going to be shumptering. They're going to destroy our expectations and our models as well as creating new opportunities for value. So we shouldn't expect everything to just roll out as though um, the world is, is run on the, on the basis of an energy model, whether it's, it's from the IEA or from a university institute. These things are just the best projections we have of how things go based on current expectations of costs and technological Im improvements. But there's gonna be surprises. All we know is that we should, we should think about our investments carefully, we should try and minimize the risks that we're making the wrong investments. We're going to have lots of stranded assets and lock-in um, emissions that are going to be very hard to deal with. But we should take advantage also of the fact that there's going to be lots of new infrastructure built in Asia in particular. And we can do this in a smarter way than we could before. And we can, we can actually make it far more energy efficient and lower emissions. Simon, thank you very much. Um, I have to, in a moment, bring this session to a close. I know there are more questions, but my proposal is that the debate should continue outside over coffee. Um, a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, we'll resume, please, at 11 o'clock. 
Uh, those of you who have booked media, media interviews, it's outside. Those of you who want, coffee is outside. The bathrooms are outside and to the right. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, engaging. It's a far-reaching debate and I've, one I found very stimulating. But I ask you particularly to join me now in thanking your excellent panel.